Does everyone here know the name Napoleon? Anyone like that's an unknown name? Why do you know the name Napoleon? And to understand why you know the name Napoleon, we need to go back to the 17th and 18th centuries when they had a, a particular way of waging war. In the 17th and 18th centuries, it was a time, it was, they were called the cabinet wars, and any war was between the royal families, and they were all related. And so wars for that period of time were like a bunch of cousins getting together to argue about who got what toys. And there was an argument using armies. This is when uh, the von Clausewitz phrase, war is a continuation of politics by other means. That's when this comes up in his uh, classic treatise on war. And, and so war was just a continuation of cousins fighting about who got what chunk of Europe. And so the names of these wars are like, there's the War of Spanish Succession. The War of Polish Succession. The War of Austrian Succession. The War of Bavarian Succession. Do you sense the theme here, right? It's like they're playing, they're arguing over who gets the G.I. Joes. It, 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 so they, who gets what chunk of, of Europe? There were very limited goals, small armies led by uh, the royalty were the officers in the armies, and, and they were changing coalitions. Like sometimes you'd fight with someone, sometimes you'd fight against them, in the same way that sometimes you get along with some of your cousins, and sometimes you don't. It was just kind of all interfamily spats. And so this was a, a time when war was ultimately safe for the nobility because you would fight a war, but the person you fought against, they might be your brother-in-law in three years, so you weren't going to push it too hard. And then the French Revolution hit. The French Revolution hit, and um, the French Revolution, at the near the beginning of it, they do something amazing. They execute Louis the Sixteenth. And they don't even execute him like royalty with a sword. As if you're going to kill a nobility, you better do it respectfully. No, they, they execute him with a guillotine like he was a common person. And all of Europe watched this happen, and they all had, it was like a simultaneous allergic reaction. All of Europe looked at this, saw it as a threat, and like a complete immune response. All of Europe like jumped on France. And they started forming these coalitions to try to take France down, because if the French way of doing things, that they could get rid of a king, that the kings weren't divinely uh, anointed, then this is a threat to the stability of Europe that has held Europe stable for about 150 to 200 years at this point. And so these coalitions get together, coalitions of Russia and Britain and Spain and Prussia and Austria. It takes seven of them before they manage to defeat France. Seven coalitions, 23 years. You would think that it would, if all of Europe decided that we want to take down France, that they'd be able to do it in something less than 23 years. Why did it take that, that long? Why did it take 23 years and seven coalitions? This gets to why we know the name Napoleon. Napoleon was an amazing general, but he led an amazing army. The French army of that day was an army like had not been seen in centuries, if ever, in Europe. Because what France realized was, if they don't win this battle, Europe will wipe them off the planet. Like, if they don't win, the French Republic will be annihilated, destroyed. They will just get rid of France altogether, divide it up between all the cousins, and France will go poof. Right? And so they realize that they are fighting for their very existence. And so they, well, they call what's called, it's called the uh, levé en mass. And what it means is everyone fights. If you're a young, young man and you can carry a sword, you're going to fight. If you're an older man, you're going to make swords for the younger men. If you're a young woman, you're going to have babies so, you can, so they can go fight. And if you're an older lady, you're going to make the cloth so you can make tents and clothing for the people who are going to go fight. This is a total war moment where the entire economy was harnessed. Every single person, every citizen a soldier, every soldier a citizen. That was the catchphrase. It, everyone is going to fight. And so Napoleon is leading armies. He's leading, he's go, they go to fight against Austria and Prussia and Russia and, and Britain, and they're putting together armies of like 20,000, 30,000. The first time they call up the levee in mass, they get 360,000. 
And by the tide of it, Napoleon is leading 800,000 people. Anyone who has ever led 800,000 people, you're going to know that person's name, right? And so Napoleon is an amazing general, but equally amazing is the fact that he led 800,000 soldiers, and that's why it took 23 years to take down France. Also amazing is the one victory that the British newspaper had. Because everyone in here thinks Napoleon is short. Anyone here, here know how, how tall Napoleon was? He was 5'2", right? Sounds pretty short. The French inch is longer than the British inch. And so the, the British newspapers had field day, just time and again, talking about the short emperor. And, and Napoleon, he was actually five foot seven, if you corrected for the length of the French inch, which is average height. Napoleon was not a short man. He was an average height man who led an extraordinary army in defense of a nation that if he did not win, they, they were going to be destroyed. And, and so this sort of threat to the very existence is what drove the levee in mass. You know who Napoleon is because the situation of terror that the whole nation would be destroyed created him. And that's why you know the name David, right? That's why we know the name David. This is the same type of threat, the same way that like Europe was going to, all of Europe was about to destroy France if they didn't defend themselves. That is the moment that we find David in when the Philistines invade. When the Philistines invade, like we know the punchline, we know how it unfolds, we know that Israel survives. If you go back to David, and, and, and David, 13-year-old David, supporting the, the military, they, they've set up the, they set up the army, he's bringing supplies for his three older brothers, they don't know that they're going to make it. Like, David is a, a part of this nation, uh, this kingdom of Israel, and they have the first king, Saul, and they're in the first years. Nothing is a given. And if they lose, the Philistines, like from the Philistine point of view, the Philistines are invading because these weird Israelites over here have taken a chunk of our farmland. And the Philistines, we need that farmland to feed our people. So they're invading to get the, what's this Israel? There's no such thing as Israel. There is no king in Israel. Saul, whatever. Just get out of the way. We want our farmland back. Right? Philistine, the Philistine, Philistine army is invading because they think it's theirs. And, and we're in the first years of a kingdom that has never existed before. And so if Israel loses, that's it. They're gone. Like They will plow salt into the fields of the people who lose, take the rest from their own farmland, interbreed with the people Israel. The Jewish people will cease to be and so Israel has called up the equivalent. They wouldn't have called it a levee in mass. They didn't speak French. But uh, that's just what they, they've done. They've called up everybody to come and be part of the military to defend uh, the, their homeland. This is why David is bringing food to them, because everyone's part of this. And they're sitting there, and, and they're, they're stuck. They're in a stalemate, because... Israel is on one hillside, and then there's a valley, and then there's the Philistine army on this hillside. And whoever goes into the valley first, loses. Because as soon as you go down to the valley, what's the other side going to do? They're going to charge down, throw nasty bits of steel, or they don't have steel, throw nasty bits of metal at you, like slingshots, and they're going to have spears, etc. As soon as you go into the valley, the other army will just run down rough shot over you, and you will be annihilated. But as long as you stay up there on your respective and so they, hill, so they're just getting up every morning and staring at each other. You going to do it today? Nope. Right? And, and so this is why they've been there for over a month. Like, how much food could you carry if you had to feed yourself on your back? A week? Right? Maybe a week and change? So th this is how it's taking the support. They're standing there staring down the Philistines and all of the, the younger brother, brothers are bringing up food to them so that they can continue to eat, so they continue to stare down the Philistines because as long as the Philistines don't invade, Israel continues to exist. So it, they're, they're, they're winning just by keeping the Philistines from invading. 
Well, the Philistines, they've got to do something about this. And so they're sending down Goliath, who is this nigh-on seven-foot behemoth of a dude who, uh, who has armor. The Philistinian technology of metalworking is superior to what the Israelites have. Right? So the Israelites know if they send someone down there to fight one-on-one, -on -one, like, if you swing your sword and hit his shield, his shield's not going to give because it's better made. Your sword? Eh! Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't survive the hit, right? And, and these battles, when you do battle one-on-one, -on -one, we see like these movies where they have like long extended duels. You know how long a duel lasts? Like 20 seconds. Like if you are actually actively trying to kill someone with a long sword and he or she is trying to kill you, it's like a minute tops before someone sticks the other with the pointy end and then you're dead, right? So, he, the, and so when Goliath comes down, he is like dressed with a superior uh, armor. He has a shield bearer. Why does he have a shield bearer? Because he's carrying, the shield is so... How heavy is a car door? Not like these newfangled, like styrofoam filled t car doors, but like an old, good F-150 car door or truck door. That's what it's like to hold up a shield of that age. It's this big old sheet of metal. So he has a shield bearer because it's just so heavy. And so Goliath is coming down and taunting them. Yeah, yeah, you don't dare take me on. And, and this is when David says he'll, t he'll take on Goliath. And so he will go down and take on Goliath. And Saul says, okay, go for it. And I don't know what Saul is thinking. Like, I don't know if Saul is thinking that, yes, God will provide, and this will work out well. Or is Saul thinking, you know what, I'll throw him at him, and if it works out, great. And if it doesn't work out, it's not like it looks like we meant it anyways. All right? So he go, David goes forth. And uh, he has a sling. And you think, ah, sling. Anyone here play with the sling when you were 12? Sling. You pull it back and you give it to kids and then you hope they don't break too many windows. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a sling that David used to kill lions and bears here. We're talking about a, a device that... For, I went on YouTube, did some research. There's a great video comparing uh, pistols to a sling. And a, here, here's the comparison. If you use a sling well, it delivers more force than a 9mm, than a 357, a little bit more than a 45, and the handgun that has more stopping power is a 44 Magnum. That's a significant weapon, isn't it? So it's not like David like prances out there, oh, I've got my sling, plink! No, he goes out there with a sling that can throw a bullet at least, a stone as hard as a bullet, at least as hard as a 357. Notice the terminology to it. It hits his forehead and it crushes, is the verb. It crushes his forehead, right? He takes him down and, and, and then he cuts his head off with his own sword. And this is the point at which it is a very reasonable thought. Like, if you are on the Philistinian army, if you're in the Philistinian army, and you're looking at, at them, and you see all of them, and they're carrying those slings, and you think that you at some point are going to have to charge a wall of stones being thrown with the force of 357s, I'd think twice about it too. And so they decide to go home, and Israel exists. Israel continues to survive because David is... Uh, pretty good with a sling. Now, again, think about how long this, this little conflict between David and Goliath would last. How long would this last? Like, from the moment that Goliath takes it seriously and pulls his sword, that's the point at which I'm throwing a stone, because if you pull a sword on me, I'm going to respond. And so I'm thinking, 20 seconds. Tops. That's how long this thing lasts. And, and, and as I was like thinking through this 20 seconds that changed the fate of, of David, changed his life, um, I thought of something that may not be an obvious connection, but has anyone here seen the movie We Bought a Zoo? There's a book by the same name, We Bought a Zoo. And uh, it's a family that they, well, they buy a zoo. Uh, that kind of gives away the punchline. But um, there's this moment when the dad and, and the teenage son uh, are, are having a, a, a discussion. And the teenage son is struggling with what's going on. And the dad looks at him and says, You know, sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. Just literally, 20 seconds of embarrassing bravery, and I promise you, something great will come of it. 
20 seconds, 20 seconds of insane courage, of embarrassing bravery, 20 seconds of absolute faith that God will get him through it, that God will be with him, and that's what happened. David comes out on the other side, and if you read the rest of the life of David, it is not all peachy, right? David goes through some real challenges. He has a... Uh, Saul kicks him out of the, the nation, uh, the kingdom, and he, has to, he ends up being a mercenary for another kingdom for a while. He has his own military problems. His wife wants to kick him out. That's a whole fun story. Right? Uh, he has his own military struggles. He has his own family problems. Bathsheba, that's a different sermon. But like in all of this, he can keep on going back to this, this moment at the beginning of his life. I charged Goliath and God brought me through it. God will probably bring me through this one too. Right, those 20 seconds of insane courage, something truly great did come out of it. And what came out of it is a man after God's own heart who trusted and believed and was willing to act on it. Now, today is Pentecost. Today is the day we celebrate uh, Pentecost, which is this moment when the people in the upper room, a bunch of very scared Jew Jews gathered together, uh, they have this moment of courage. It's not quite the same level of insane courage as charging a seven-foot man trying to kill you, but it's still courageous because what they do is they rush out of that room and they find as many people as they can to tell about Jesus. And, and I, I don't think people change. I, like, I don't think people, well, let me rephrase, rephrase that. I don't think that the nature of people change. I don't think that those people 2,000 years ago were je any more likely than we are. Like, is anyone here likely to run out the door after this and start going to the gas station and grabbing as many people as you can to start telling, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Like, anyone planning on doing that? Right? We, what we, I, that would be something embarrassingly brave, wouldn't it? Right? I'm not asking you to either. Don't, don't worry about that. But that is what happened on Pentecost. Is a group of people who were willing to have 20 seconds of embarrassing bravery to walk out the door and say, I, I need to tell you about Jesus. Because this is something has just happened. I need you to know about it. And something great comes out of it. Because that is the day that the church changes from being a bunch of Jewish Palestinian Christians. And they walk out the door and they start talking to people from all over the known world. And the church changes its character like that. And now it is a church of excited people from all around the world. This is all, then this is also why the, this is the day that we practice baptisms and confirmations and memberships. Right? Ba Pentecost is the day, traditionally, this is the day when people join the church. Why is that? Well, I believe joining the church, it, it takes about 20 seconds to say, I will. Right? It does not take all that long, but it is a courage, courageous act, an act of faith, to stand in front of people and say, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? I do. That is an amazing act of faith. It's an amazing act of faith to be baptized. It's an amazing act of faith to stand in front of a congregation and say, are you going to be part of this family here? And to say, yeah. Yeah, I am. That's a courageous thing. It's courageous to be confirmed, because what do you do when you get confirmed? You're a teenager who stands up and say that you say that you agree with your parents. That's a courageous thing to do as a teen. <laughs> You agree with the faith that they confessed when you were an infant. As I think back to David, I wonder, would he have had the courage to, to charge Goliath every day? Like, he, he charged Goliath once. Would he have the faith and the courage to charge Goliath Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? Would he do that often? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he speaks of the gifts of the Spirit, that some people have the gift of great faith, some people have the gift of great knowledge, some people have the gift of great wisdom, some people have the gift of prophecy, some people have the gift of, of service. He talks about all these gifts, and I find it fascinating that he lists faith as one of the gifts of the Spirit, which means that some of us have the gift of great faith and some of us do not. Some of us have the faith to make that commitment in baptism, and then that, that's, like the, that's their, the, our 20 seconds of insane courage. And the rest of the time, maybe we don't have that great faith. That's me. But I don't have a great faith. I would not charge Goliath repeatedly. I hope I could charge him once. Hope I'd have lots of time to practice with a sling beforehand. Right? But uh, I, I don't have a great faith. Some people do. 
But it changes everything to, to be able to risk it, to take that 20 seconds of insane courage, that great faith, to take a swing at it. And if you have that great faith just when you need it, that, that's the gift that God will give. The faith I have is, is enough. It, it, I wish it was greater. I wish it was more. But like to walk up to the bishop and to kneel on, on something about like that, and, and for the bishop to lay hands on me and, and say, take thou authority and to ordain me, like that's, that's a moment you're walking up and it's like, do I really believe this? Am I going to commit my life to this? Is it going to be what I do from here on out? Because once you're ordained, like, that's it. That is a moment that changes your life. Yeah, I did. 20 seconds of insane courage, and uh, it changed the future of my life by the grace of God. And I'm very thankful for it. I want to invite you to be open to this. I want to invite you to be open to occasions when 20 seconds of insane courage, of embarrassing bravery, 20 seconds of faith believing that God will see you through. You don't have to be brave enough to charge Goliath every day, but when Goliath is there, trust that God will get you through that 20 seconds just as God did with David. Amen.